Forgotten Lore, Episode 3, Theories of Obscurity. And uh, welcome back to Forgotten Lore. This is the show on YouTube. Um, I use the word show loosely because it's me talking to uh, my laptop. Uh, we just had a Starship Enterprise moment there where my, my knee hit the table and it looks like there's an earthquake. Um let me reel it back in. This is the uh, YouTube show where I explore the uh, lesser known nooks and crannies of dark fiction throughout the ages, uh, particularly by, by authors who are no longer with us. Um, this week, though, I'm making a bit of a departure from that, uh, and I have a good reason. And that reason is I realize that I have a soapbox here uh, on YouTube for, you know, the couple of dozen people who have been checking out uh, the videos. And uh, and so by, by damn, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use uh, the, uh, the, the, the soapbox that I have. And uh, I'm going to talk about theories of obscurity. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, one that's um, a better known theory of obscurity, if you want to, you know, kind of embrace that paradox. And then I'm going to talk about my own personal Theory of Obscurity. Uh, the title of this video comes from the, uh, is derived from the, the title of a documentary about the avant-garde music group, The Residents. And uh, you can find out about this documentary on, on uh, uh, you know, the internet, that thing out there, that, that World Wide Web that all the kids are talking about. You can, uh, you can look that up on there and you can find out a little bit about them and about that documentary. But uh, these are a group of musicians who have um, gone around for, for their entire career masked. And, um, and so no one really knows who they are or if the lineup has changed over the years. Um, they've been going at it for about four decades. But, um, but their theory of obscurity and the reason why they allegedly the reason why they wear masks is because they're convinced that uh, artists do their best work when they're still obscure. And that's their theory of obscurity. Is that true? I don't know. But it's something interesting to contemplate. What I'm more interested in is inflicting my own theory of obscurity on you. And uh, I say inflict because it's kind of a soul crusher. <laughs> Um, if you take it seriously, and if if you uh, if you listen to it, um, and my theory of obscurity goes like this: we are all ultimately obscure. Uh, that even the very big names in pop culture are obscure. Even now, it's not that they're going to become obscure at some point in the future. Even now, they're obscure. Now, how can I say such a thing? My theory is that even authors who are very well known, like Stephen King, um, are obscured by their fame. Now, follow me through here. That um, that even if you become famous, what happens is you then become a mass commodity, and um, and so people stop getting to know who you are as a person and even the depth of your work. And they look for a one dimensional uh, sort of label for you. So Stephen King will always be the horror writer for the most part. Um, and, um, and he's been, you know, uh, interested in uh, evading that tag. Uh, but if I asked, if I went up and down my street out here in my little, my little uh, uh, Dan and Roseanne sort of uh, suburb, and I asked, who is Stephen King? They're going to say, the horror guy. Um, and at the same time, they're probably not going to know that many other authors. You know, if I asked them who John Grisham was, they're probably not going to know who that is even. They may, a, f a few may, but if they do, they're going to say that legal thriller guy and the actual person of John Grisham, the uh, the depth of that person, everything that person has been through, uh, all of the, whatever depth there is to, to his work. I don't know. I've not read Grisham, but um, what, you know, whatever's there becomes truncated and, and flattened into this little two-dimensional thing. 